guys. Welcome back. So we're gonna continue with the sushi plates today. And again with the one pound of clay. So I'm gonna use an open end box, okay? And keep this ball or sphere moving. And I'm gonna keep slapping it so I have a ball or sphere shape. And this helps to compress the clay, get it nice and dense. Let's just know how dense or what the clay body can be. Just open it in the box tan. Once you feel it getting kind of nice and stiff, you need to start slapping it out. If you don't want to slap it out, that's okay. You can just put it on the table, but we're going to make uh, uh, this other variation on the sushi plate today. So I believe these are Lisa's. Aren't those super cute? She made these. And of course, you're welcome to add whatever kind of stamp work you want and add whatever kind of feet that you like. And here we have some uh, slip decoration. And this was a napkin ring holder that she did with the stamp. And then this one, she had a little divider, which is nice. And this little uh, spray mold. That's super cute. That's by Lisa. Uh, Lisa Chachia. And she makes amazing ceramics. So I would uh, look her up on Facebook too. She makes amazing stuff as well as uh, glass work. So we have her nice little examples that we get to look at. Those are cute. So we're going to start with a little piece of clay, our one pound ball of clay. And we're going to take our ball up high up and we'll slam it down. Again, uh, we want to uh, stretch this clay out evenly in every single direction possible. So we're always going to do that quarter turn, pick up our clay with the fullness of our hand, slam it down. And you'll notice it might be a little bit thicker in some areas than others. And that's okay, because it's just the beginning of that. Press it down a little bit, and then pick it up with the fullness of our hand, slam it down, and start slapping. of our hand, turn it that quarter turn, flip it over, and slap. Right, spin, relax, all the best you can, and then take your slap, and slap with a flat piece of clay, put it down, slap, 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 pick up the piece of clay, turn it that quarter turn, and flip it over. Again, remember, we want to stretch the clay evenly in every single direction. If we don't, whichever direction we stretch the clay out the most in, that's the direction it's going to shrink in, in the kiln. This clay body will shrink about uh, 10 to 15 percent overall, so if we stretch it out evenly in every direction, it's less likely to crack, warp, and fissure. So, and that's about good for about, uh, our uh, dowel size. Again, you can pick these dowels up um, at Home Depot or True Value, and these act like a bumper, but you can use anything you have at home. The idea is when you're rolling out slabs is that you want to work slowly from thick to thin and keep the slab an even thickness throughout the whole process again or also crack warp fissure. So when we roll our slab, we're going to roll fingertips past the wrists, <clears throat> turn it up quarter turn, flip it over. So we're curving pressing both sides of the plate, fingertips past the wrists. And once you notice your slab is no longer expanded, we'll move down to the three eighths, so we have three eighths. Fingertips past the wrists. And you notice it's moving a little bit. Fingertips past the wrists. And then again, as a reminder, you'll notice I'm trying not to um, move my clay by picking it up with its fingertips, just lifting it so I can support the full mass with the full surface area with my hand. And back down to the quarters, quarter inch. No, fingertips past the wrists. And now we want to kind of start keeping in mind the uh, size and shape that we're looking for. So I'm getting pretty close to what I want. I'm just going to add just a little bit of pressure, just a little bit, so the clay will know. Remember that little bit of force in that direction. <sighs> Fingertips are the wrists. I'm probably going to take it a little bit thinner. Uh, depending on who's going to be using this plate, um, I like to leave it this thick at the quarter inch if it's like for kids. Uh, if I know uh, it's going to receive a, quite a beating, but I'm going to go down a little bit thinner. 
to these uh, skewered sides, and you can pick these up again at any uh, at the grocery store when you're picking up your essentials. Now we're going again to try to support the full mass of the slab. If we had any slab hanging over the edge when we flipped it, that might be an area where it will crack. So we're going to just gentle pressure in that direction. Sometimes I want it to go stretching in that direction as well. And I'm looking pretty good. We're getting pretty close. So fingertips, past the wrists. Nice, one long fluid motion. Check our form. Ah, oh, it fits. Yay. I'm going to do one more. And what's really nice about working on uh, at home is you can work at your leisure and come back to things. Uh, everything we're using today, you probably have already at home. Skewers for barbecue, a rolling pin or a dowel. Again, you can just slap it out. Um, but uh, I like working with the dowel so I ensure I have an even product no matter where or when I had to build for any reason when you don't have access to certain tools. But honestly, a hand-built slab is much stronger than any sort of machine-built slab, like out of a, a slab roller. If you can't make a slab by hand, um, once you start using a slab machine or a slab roller um, without having the good uh, principles and practices in place, all your stuff's going to crack for um, uh, fissure which you see a lot, especially when you work with large slabs. So uh, we'll just put these to the side for now. I got these little uh, forms, these little sushi plates. Um, again, at, uh, probably a secondhand shop. I love secondhand shops. I don't ever uh, condone buying plastic new. Um, it's just not good for the environment, but I do I do like to buy used ones. And at the at the upcycle stores, it's really fun because I mean I, I have these are apparently from Portland, Maine, and who knows if this artisan is still even around. And they're just really great forms, and I've used them like tens of thousands of times over the years. And I just love finding these neat sets of things, thrift stores or uh, consignment shops. The, yard sales, uh, flea markets, you know, it's really fun. You never know what kind of treasures you'll find. So I am going to use this form as a hot mold, slot mold, simple former. I love this form again because uh, I can use it on the inside or on the outside. So it is plastic, so that means our clay, since it has all this water in it, it might uh, stick to our non-porous form. So you just want to add enough pressure to keep the form in place, you don't want to put too much pressure downward on the piece so the clay may stick. Now when I'm using the skewer, you notice I'm using the, the edge or perimeter as a guide to cut it out all the way around. You'll notice the skewer is staying straight up and down or vertical. And you can always go around for an extra cut just in case because things may move. You don't want to hold a weird sort of 45 degree angle because that will create who knows what kind of cut. Um, these weird, hard, sharp angles as opposed to, again, this nice, uh, clean edge all the way around. Then you have little scraps that you can use to practice your stamp work on to see if you like something or not. So that's what I like to keep the scraps for, just to try out a stamp before I commit to my form. So I'm going to peel the form off very gently and slowly so we don't destroy our pieces. And you'll notice you'll have all these little burrs or on the edge or perimeter of your piece, and you just want to gently roll those off. And we're kind of um, rounding off this lip here. If I like to think of when I cut into my slab work, I created two cuts. This top edge, or this top 90 degree angle that's exposed to the air or atmosphere, and then again the, the bottom one that's exposed to the table. So, we want to round off, smooth off these edges. We're compressing them because when we cut the clay, we aerated that edge a little bit. And just very gentle, soft, continual, long strokes. You don't want to focus too much on your imperfections or you don't want to focus on your mistakes too much because again, you're just going to highlight them and make them worse. And that's going to become super laser sharp in the kiln once the glaze melts on it, as opposed to a nice rounded edge. So very gentle, very soft, just trying to smooth out. So just gentle, 
Gentle If you notice um, the clay is kind of sticking or drying, you can add just a tiny bit of lubrication to your fingers, just a tiny drop of water, and that will allow your fingers to fly across the surface. And we're just smoothing it out. We don't really want to add too much pressure because we don't want to uh, change the shape or form. Now, at this point, be very, very careful when you pick up your slab, again, supporting the, the full mass of the full surface area the best you can. Put the in hands and very gently flip over your slab. If you just threw down your piece of slab like this, it will um, misshapen and deform. And that's no fun having to try to fix that. So again, don't focus on your imperfections. Don't focus on your mistakes. But instead, just keep going around the edge or perimeter or circle, and everything will work itself out. And that looks pretty good. I like to use even two hands sometimes. Again, very gentle, very soft. Without any little spurs or crumbs. Ceramics is a, a medium of functionality. So I like my pieces to be really clean because I don't want my user to cut themselves or cut their finger. And that, that's really no fun when you cut yourself on a piece of glaze or, or, sh or shop, a sharp piece of pottery. In fact, they use uh, ceramic blades in uh, eye surgery. They make a, a high fire, high end porcelain knives out of uh, the high fire porcelain or the obsidian glass because it's the only thing that can cut at the molecular level. And unlike lasers, there's a lot of uh, people who can't use lasers for whatever reason. And uh, so they still do a lot of uh, surgeries by hand and uh, porcelain knives. Super sharp, super high end. So that looks pretty good. <clears throat> I like simple, simple is best. Um, anything with a 3D uh, quality, Again, you can use that as a stamp in your work. This is a cute little uh, 3D printed stamp from our wonderful friend Peyton made for us. So I'm just gonna make these for friends shop. I'm hoping. Or as little gifts. So I'm gonna put this on the side. Now I've worked with this stamp a lot before, so I know I need to press pretty well on that edge or perimeter of the stamp and all the way through. Which is why again I like practicing all these scraps. And that looks okay. That looks good. I'm just going to reflect that up here as well. Just more. Just that type of thing. Makes it simple. And then, cut some of the clay. Uh, when you're doing your design work, I like going no more than halfway through the clay body thickness. Anymore, again, you're uh, subjecting your pieces to cracks and warps and fissures. Luckily, um, uh, I was able to register my stamp back to where it was. So it's kind of shallow, so I'm going to give it a little bit more pressure. So I love it. Um, and then it's shaking a little bit. That's okay. You just kind of pat it back a little bit. It don't really matter. It's all good. Once we start forming it, that makes it all those little imperfections and mistakes. And you just don't be so mean to yourself. Ceramics is again that kind of a production medium. So you just take what you learn and what you want to do better or differently into the next piece. We can also, well, I'm gonna to wait to cut back because I'm gonna do one more stamp. Yeah, so don't be too hard on yourself because again, you're learning in the beginning what you like and how to move your body and how to move your clay. So there's just no point in being mean. You know, you just enjoy, enjoy the feel of the clay. And this is my little signature stamp. And again, I honestly wouldn't worry about that, you know, I think at this level, what I sell these plates for, what I can get for them, it's really not worth it. It's just better again to know next time to not go so deep and then I will do better or differently on the next piece if I so wish. You can also uh, register your form back and cut it up. It's just, you know, sometimes it's just better to move on, accept it for what it is, appreciate it for what it is. 
So again, I'm picking up the plate with the fullness of my hand, trying to support the mass and the surface area the best that I can to prevent those cracks, warts, and fissures. I put uh, little strips of newspapers in between my clay form and the, the pookie, or the slump mold, slump mold, pump mold, simple former. And the paper is nice because I can register my uh, clay form to my mold underneath. And I'm gonna just very gently start pressing in that shoulder corner of the piece. I'm also gonna uh, kind of push with the thickness of the clay, this edge, so I'm not, uh, so all the pressure of the forming isn't just happening in the shoulder where your piece is more likely to uh, crack and break and work and fissure. So I'm gonna use my fingertips, um, pushing down on the thickness, but not so much pushing it down where I'm altering the shape, but just, just kind of placing that mass very gently into the form. I'm also using my thumbs to push out a little bit into the shoulder, pushing down on that lip or edge or perimeter. And then those little crummies, and you just move them away. Not ever getting towards the end. You can worry about those little things, but there's no point in wearing them before. You just never know what will happen. And that looks pretty good. That looks cute. It's not fully lined up. Again, you can move the paper around, patch it up. And then don't forget to give your wall enough verticality to compensate for the sloping. I know how much this uh, piece slumps in this form when I fire it in the kiln. So I like where it's at. I think this is good. This will hold all those juicy juices that run off the plate or would run off the plate. So that hopefully no dribbles. And that's it. Pretty much done. Super cute. You can make a bunch of these. These are great little gifts. I love these in the uh, holiday season because I love to bake and you can put a little waffle bread on there, wrap it up in cellophane and give it as a gift or teas and a little uh, tea kits. I mean, these are just a wonderful base to put just about anything on as a gift. And I think that's it for this uh, variation of a sushi plate. So again, thank you guys for all your comments and questions. And keep sending me uh, pictures of stuff that you would like to learn how to make or anything uh, you're struggling with in your process and hopefully we can go over that. And I hope you have a beautiful night and stay safe. Uh, keep practicing washing your hands thoroughly and your social distancing and hopefully we'll all get through this uh, virus. I hope you have a good night. And here's like a little close up.